Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to give you a crash course in machine learning. Part 1. Yes, this will be a many part series. Who's this for? This is for complete novices. So if you've gone through my tutorial series on coding a neural network from scratch or any of the other high quality tutorials on YouTube, this video probably isn't for you. If, on the other hand, you are competent at programming and are just looking for a little bit of information on what exactly machine learning is and some of the examples of it, then this is for you. So let's define machine learning. Apart from being a very popular buzzword, machine learning is a class of algorithms that help you find patterns in data. And more importantly, use that data to make more, uh, predictions about unknown data. And this could, of course, refer to numerical values or classes of things. So numerical values would be things like housing prices, credit scores, actuarial risk tables, things like that. Classes would include, say, cancerous or not cancerous in the case of looking at uh, uh, tumors, or images of cats versus dogs, for instance. So why has machine learning become so popular all of a sudden? If you're familiar with the field of AI, you probably know that a lot of this stuff goes back many decades, so it may be a little bit surprising that all of a sudden machine learning is a hot topic. Well, really, it's a confluence of two different factors. In recent years, people have given all sorts of data to Google, Facebook, YouTube, and all the other social media websites. So there's this massive amount of data out there, and that happens to match up to a point in time when we have access to massive computing power. In particular, NVIDIA has been leading the way with their uh, GPUs, which are just big, giant, inherently parallel processors. So you can do things with GPUs that you would need an entire data center to do on CPUs. Everyday examples we would all be familiar with. Perhaps you've heard of Siri or Alexa or even OK Google. Yes, all of these leverage machine learning to better serve you. The voice to text algorithms are a great example of that, um, as well as their recommendations. So, uh, another example would be Pandora songs. So, Pandora classifies music based on a whole variety of factors. Uh, to recommend things that they think you will like. And you train that algorithm by giving thumbs up or thumbs down on various songs. YouTube works in a similar way where they find content that is similar to what you're watching and that happens to match up with what they want you to see. Kind of a more mundane example that we've become used to are spam email filters. You know, you probably don't trust that prince from Nigeria that wants to give you some $10 million for the low, low price of just a $10,000 wire transfer through Western Union as well as if you've ever been contacted by your credit card company regarding some suspicious activity, that was machine learning. And kind of disturbingly, if you've ever posted up photos on Facebook, you'll see that they will suggest who they think is in that photo. And that's just facial recognition algorithms. Really, it boils down to three basic types of machine learning. Supervised, where you have some training data that you've already classified. So in our tutorial series on building a neural network from scratch, we dealt with handwritten characters of digits, right, that humans had classified to be a digit between 0 and 9. And in some sense, this is humans teaching computers to teach themselves, right? So the humans go through the mountain of data, classify things, and feed that into the algorithm so that the algorithm can learn from it, and then use that information to make predictions about previously unseen data. Now, what if you don't have labels? Well, then you need something called unsupervised machine learning. As you might guess, this means that you only have a pile of data. You don't have any labels or classes for that data. In general, this will be some quantity you're looking at, and it will depend on a higher dimensional space. So you could be trying to classify people as credit worthy or uncredit worthy, and it could be a, a combination of a whole bunch of factors, including their age, demographics, uh, income, things like that. And basically, in a nutshell, the algorithm tries to find patterns on its own and then use that to predict the classification of previously unseen data. 
And finally, we have what's called reinforcement learning, and it's kind of similar to supervised learning in some senses, except we replace the label with a reward function. In this case, we have an agent, the AI, acting within some environment, and that results in some reward function that tells it how close it got to its desired outcome. So for, let's say, self-driving cars, if the car makes it to its destination without hitting anything or getting any speeding tickets, then it is granted a large reward. If, on the other hand, it runs over a whole family of ducks, well, then we want to penalize it because that's a bad thing. Supervised learning, uh, there are many examples of this. So one example is logistic regression, where you have some high dimensional space, in this case we've taken a two-dimensional projection, and you want to classify whatever it is into multiple classes. In this case we only have two, red and green, uh, however there is no limit to the number of classes. And so logistic regression defines some contour in this higher dimensional space that allows you to say, okay, if I have a new data point and it falls within this contour, then it is of this class. Similarly, you have what's called linear regression, where you have some data that um, depends on, again, a large number of parameters. Let's say you're talking about housing prices. Well, the price of a house is going to depend on many different things. It'll depend on the square footage, number of bathrooms, neighborhood, average home price in the area, uh, etc. You know, the school district, all of these things. When you, pl you obviously can't plot all of these things in two or three dimensional space, but there is some dependence in that higher dimensional space. And you just uh, uh, come up with the residual sum of squares in the higher dimensional space to see where those data points lie. And you can use that to make predictions about an unseen home. So if you had a new home, you just plug in all the parameters and it tells you what the housing price should be. You also have what are called support vector machines, which are another mechanism for classifying things into different groups. These have kind of fallen out of vogue in recent years, although they are still useful. Basically, it defines a hyperplane in that higher dimensional space, and everything falling on one side belongs to one class, everything falling on the other belongs to another. Of course, all the rage uh, at present is neural networks, and these are mathematical models of what is going on inside the human brain. Basically, you take some input data, you perform mathematical translations that feed forward through the network, and each sub subsequent layer you perform more operations on it, and that spits out some output that belongs to uh, one of any number of classes. And these have become very popular because they're quite powerful. You can add many different layers, you can add in uh, various other features that make them more complicated, but they are probably the most hot topic in deep learning, or sorry, in uh, machine learning right now. Unsupervised learning, again, remember we just have some blob of data and we can cluster this data in a higher dimensional space to see what the relationships between that data is. Oftentimes, you'll be dealing with hundreds of parameters and many of these may be redundant. They could be just a multiplicative factor of another constant or they may be irrelevant to calculating whatever it is you're looking for in the first place, in which case we can perform dimensionality reduction where you take something that is, say, 150 dimensions and compress it down into 47 dimensions. In this case, we've taken a sphere, a three-dimensional object, and flattened it into a circle, a two-dimensional object. In reinforcement learning, we have some agent, our AI, that performs some action within its environment, leading to a reward. A great example of this is chess. So, in chess, there are no classes, there's no continuous variable to predict, there's simply an outcome. Do you win the game or do you lose? Or do you have a draw, I suppose? In this case, you have the computer iterate through a bunch of different combinations of moves to see how it turns out, and it assigns a numerical score to each of these outcomes, try to maximize that score. So in any given set of, uh, any given board configuration, it can calculate what is the highest probability of receiving a maximum reward and make the move that corresponds to that course of action. One great example of this is when uh, Deep Blue beat Kasparov in the late 1990s. It was quite a feat at the time, I recall it. Uh, it was unexpected. People didn't think that a machine could beat a human, right? Human insight trumps everything, or so we thought. Now, I don't believe that Deep Blue used modern machine learning methods, but it used something relatively similar. A more uh, modern example of this would be AlphaGo, which is a 
quite a monumental achievement. The machine uh, learning algorithm actually managed to defeat one of Asia's top champions in Go, which is a uh, an incredibly complex game. I don't pretend to know anything about it, though. If you're curious, go check it out. It's a pretty neat story. So that's it in a nutshell. You have three different types of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. There's many different flavors amongst each of those, but in general, you're trying to find relationships between sets of parameters and some observable variable. And in particular, you're more most concerned with being able to make predictions on previously unseen data. In future videos, we'll look at uh, a little bit more details on how these things work, but for now, this should give you enough to go to a dinner party and at least sound like you know something about the topic. To receive notifications of those future videos, make sure to subscribe. If you found the content helpful, leave a thumbs up, comment, and I hope to see you all in the next video.